Welcome back. Welcome back, friend. How you feeling today? I'm good. You feel it? No, we can't say good, M. Um, it's, it's, it's good is not a descriptor. Like, how are you feeling? Okay, okay. I Be am. In tune. I'm balancing joy and grief right now. Mm. As we have talked about, um, our dog is dying. I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, that was totally unexpected. He's really young. Um, and we're going on vacation next week and I'm doing our podcast and we're living. And so it's been heavy and amazing. How about you? Yeah, I feel like as we get older, we just have to be more secure in knowing that that's what life is going to do. It's going to ebb. It's going to flow. Yeah. You said something to me when I was sharing about our dog and I was saying like, I don't know, I must be cursed or something. And you're like, nope, you're just living life. (laughs) It's life. (laughs) This is what happens. Um, How about you? I am feeling not quite alert. Um, I came back from a whirlwind of travel. I was in New York for New York Fashion Week. I'm still posting content from Fashion Week. I call it the Fashion Olympics, honey. Um, And so I'm just trying to get my bearings back, honestly. So I feel like my feet haven't quite touched the ground. I'm just kind of sprinting, to use a sports uh, analogy, sprinting from race to race. Mm. But things are going to level off soon, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that, too. You have a sabbatical coming up. I do. Stay tuned. It's gonna be something. I love how um, people have actually like taken taken the sabbatical terminology away from academia because we all deserve sabbaticals, not just tenured professors. Absolutely. And and for me, I was like, well, why am I calling a sabbatical and not just a vacation? But I think I'm being intentional by calling it a sabbatical because I will work on a vacation in half a heartbeat. But a sabbatical consciously means I'm removing myself. And there's also something different about a vacation, right? I don't know in my mind, right? A sabbatical feels like an intentional period of rest and space from your life. Yeah, I like that. Whereas a vacation, you might be with friends, you might be with family, you might be with a partner, you might be traveling and visiting a lot of places and doing sightseeing or trying new things. And maybe you'll do some of that on your sabbatical, but it feels more, I envision you more kind of in an empty room. (laughs) So let's jump into today's episode, which is all about the soft life. But before we get there, what is the biggest accomplishment of your life, friend? Just a little food for thought for our listeners. Biggest physical accomplishment. Oh, physical accomplishment, yes. Does it have to be just one? Oh, you've had a lot. Go ahead. I would say that the five biggest physical accomplishments <laughs> of my life. I have birthed three children. Oh, yeah. Talk about that. Through my vagina. Pop your shit. Two unmedicated. Not on purpose. But I did it. (laughs) And I ran two marathons. It's the marathons for me, too. Because that is a level of pain that I don't know why people willingly get themselves into. Well, you have to really question. I mean, isn't the history of it that the person died when he got to the other side of it? Yeah, people die all the time. See, now, come on, man. Come on. I I don't. Okay, good for you. Okay, what about you? Uh, I would say probably that I've been incredibly drunk and hungover and gotten back on the horse several times. Guys, this is so true. This is so unbelievably true. Tashira can operate with so little sleep in Mm -hmm. such a bad way. And I would talk about McLean. (laughs) Like I, I, I would be, I, I don't understand how you do it. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can just keep going and going and going. The Energizer Bunny, I, I do, and, and and um, it's not always a good thing, but I guess it is oh, a physical accomplishment. Absolutely not. But like, if I really had things to get done, you remember that week I went from L.A. to Boston to like New York, and no, I went from Florida to L.A. to Boston in quick succession. Yeah, different time zones. Like it just was a different day of the week. I was in a whole different city. I think one of the the misconceptions about your work and our work together is that it's not work. Mm, mm -hmm. And it's a different type of work for sure. But there's a lot of work involved with preparing these episodes and taping them and creating them. And that's just like one of the 8 million things you do. And I just mentioned coming back from New York Fashion Week too. It it is, few people have 
such an intense schedule of not just having to physically be present at a thing and do a thing, but also on the backside, be in real time creating the content of documenting the experience in real time. So the labor that goes into that is on a different level. Y'all better give y'all favorite content creators some love out here because like we are out here <laughs> burning the midnight oil, operating off of a little sleep. And, and they um, look so good. You see what I mean? Like my concealer game to cover those bags under my eyes all week, Margo. I'm learning new makeup tricks. Uh, so yeah, so, so my ability to just like pop back up is probably a big physical accomplishment. I would say for sure. And the other thing too is that some physical but some emotional is that hopefully you agree that I think I I navigated um cancer, my surgery, my chemo, and my radiation with a pretty positive mindset. Absolutely. I also think you have another yes, absolutely. I think you have another incredible physical emotional accomplishment ability, if that's a Okay. It it it's mind body that you process things, hard things, so fast. Like you process them and they like come in and you process and you talk and then they're out. Yeah. That is such a gift. Thank you, friend. I really admire you in that way, that you can let shit go. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a tool of resiliency. For sure. Yeah, I, I just, I kind of feel, it's, it's one of those soft skills that I think has been an undercurrent to my success and coming from where you know I've come from. And so I just feel like if that shit ain't killed me, it's just made me stronger, right. so and let's when, keep it moving. And when stuff doesn't go your way, whether it's big or small, you acknowledge it. It's not like you fake it Mm-mm. or you acknowledge it and you're like, okay, not meant to be. So quick story, y'all. Um, the first White Tone All Season retreat did not go as good as I would have wanted. And in But real- our retreats are going to be amazing. <laughs> we have learned, and that's the point of this story, that in the moment, I had to make a lot of adaptations. And I thought to myself, I could be really embarrassed. I could let this whole thing fall apart. I could go and run and hide and not show back up. Or I can face it and be like, okay, everything that can go wrong, not, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but let's just say, everything that can go wrong went wrong and intentionally so that the next time I do it I can do it much better and so I try to always frame things from that mindset that's really really helpful and I think will be really helpful for a lot of people listening and watching okay I'm excited to get into this episode but first we have a quote um and this is uh not dumb it's just deeply upsetting but I think sometimes our most upsetting things can provide an opportunity for us to kind of move forward so um We're taping this episode the second week of February 2023. It should come out in the next couple weeks. Um, But this week, February, I believe either February 14th or February 15th, 2023, the CDC released a new study that showed that teen girls across the United States are engulfed in a growing wave of violence and trauma, according to federal researchers who released data Monday. Oh, so it's February 13th which shows an increase in rape, sexual violence, as well as record levels of feeling sad and hopeless. So I was interviewed about this report this week. Uh, We'll link it in our show notes. Um, And you and I are both doing work that is responsive to this report. Um, But are you surprised? I'm not surprised. And I also wonder, is there comparative data? Because if these kinds of studies had existed during our adolescence, if the same data would have been um, apparent, right? How does it compare to previous generations? I, I would be really interested in. But just having relationships with the young people right now, having also been a former classroom teacher, I taught middle and I taught high school, I am absolutely not surprised. So I'm absolutely not surprised either. And I I agree and said very similar responses. I think we have, first of all, there weren't studies like this in our youth or prior necessarily. But I think there is a greater facility in talking about our own mental health. And mm. young people have more access to information about mental well-being and language around mental health than we did for sure. And there is, while there's still stigma, there's way less stigma about men- having a mental health disorder. So whether there's more acknowledgement of the pain that individuals are suffering because we have more language or there's actual more mm. shit going on, I think 
is a question. I also think the social social isolation of COVID um, is going to have really nefarious downstream impacts on young people and already has in terms of understanding how to interact. I think what just deeply saddens me is this idea of them being engulfed in a growing wave of violence and trauma. Just that visual for me is so incredibly heartbreaking. And it also means like, what do we have to expect? What is going to come from this moment in time? I mean, young people are, I hate to be trite, our future. So these are people who one day are gonna be the politicians, the school teachers, the nurses. trash collectors, the nurses. Like, what does it mean? So there is this quote that the Maasai give an African tribe. Um, I don't know it in their language, but I know the English transla translation is, and how are the children? So when you greet someone, it's not about how they're doing. It's about how the kids are. So you say, how are the children? And if this is how the children are, I think what the Messiah implicitly understand is we're not good if the kids ain't good. We are not good if this is what our children are experiencing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So um, you all, please take a look at the article. Obviously, take a look at Margot's response, which has been really, really important and critical, especially as we talk about sexual violence that also our young, our young people are experiencing at record numbers. Uh, we have lots of work to do, and we will also recommend in the show notes some organizations that you can give to who are doing great work with Absolutely. our kids. Absolutely. And like anything, being reactive is not the idea. It's being being proactive and so education around sexuality and intimacy and pleasure and consent um, needs to happen a lot younger before people are in situations where they might not feel like they have autonomy. Comprehensive sexuality education has to be a topic of discussion in every school building, every school board meeting, every discussion around curricula. It is vital and our kids are suffering without it. Absolutely. Before we get to the topic of the day, let's get back a little bit to the podcast and our sponsor. Stay tuned for some new developments on the podcast. We'll be starting a paid community soon where you'll get access to new and extra content that's not yes. available for free. Um, it's not a high cost, but it's a low bar to access us in more real time. We'll have chat boards after each episode, including retroactively back to episode one of season one, extra podcast per month in and including uh, live virtual live meetups yeah, around I'm different topics. So excited for these live chats because one of the things that brought us here were our lunchtime chats that yeah. we were having over on Instagram. Yeah, and so we're, we have lots of different ideas, but just stay tuned because some of the ideas are, are kind of documentary talks, book talks, and, and pop culture talks. And we also need to get back into our obsession with cults. It's time, friend. Oh, it really is time. Yeah. Well, there's so much... The Sarah Lawrence cult. Uh, we we got to get there, y'all. Just a teaser. We're, just a teaser. Is, it's just a teaser. We, we're going to get there in the private community. Okay. Exci so exciting. Okay. Let's get to our sponsor. We're thrilled about our sponsor today, Osea Malibu. Protect your skin from winter dryness with their hero product, the Osea Body Butter, Andaria Algae Body Butter. Um, Osea products are all cruelty-free, vegan, climate-neutral. They're wonderful, wonderful skin, face, and body products. Uh, right now, we have a wonderful collaboration with them. Let's support it with a special discount. Uh, you will get 10% off your first order site-wide with our code, Justice10, um, oseamalibu.com, O-S-E-A malibu.com, Justice10, free shipping um, with any order over $60, as well as free samples with any order over $60. That's a great deal. Yeah, it's a really good deal. They also have great combo sales where you can buy different products at the same time and get a slight discount. I would say personally, I've used their products for a really long time. I, every day, use the Undaria Algae Body Oil as I get out of the shower and then follow that with the body butter. Um, particularly in the winter, I find both to be really comforting and my skin has not gotten too dry this winter. During the summer, I just use the oil. Uh, but, but all of their products are wonderful. Tashire has had a longstanding partnership with them and has used a lot of their skin products as well. Let me just say for our melanated uh, listeners, this thing is an ash killer. The Andaria Algae Body Butter. I am someone who has perpetually dry, very, very dry hands. And I love the way this feels as I'm putting it on my hands, y'all. Because the great part about it is that 
the moisture holds. It's locked in, but it doesn't leave your hands feeling greasy. Yeah, it's not oily, right? So it's it's thick without being slimy. Right, which is, I think, a hard thing to do. Maybe it's something to do with the seaweed that Osea puts in their we products. We know seaweed really helps everything. So thank you, Osea, for sponsoring this episode. You all make sure you use our code at oseamalibu.com. We will link our favorite products in the show notes. Absolutely. Let's get to our episode today because I think not only do some of our listeners need some education around what is the soft life or how this term has been coined, um, but I think we need to reinterpret it potentially or or individualize it. Mm. Um for us, because one of the tenets of our work here on the podcast, but also the way you and I are trying to live our lives is that of wellness. And what does wellness mean to us? It's not just eating a certain way, being a certain weight. It's full wellness. Like, how are we happy? How are we socializing? And how are we engaging with the world? I often say the goal is to be healthy and whole. And that's my affirmation on a daily basis. I am healthy and whole. I am healthy and whole. And of course, that it's very personalized. And so enter into the chat this idea of the soft life. Now, if you are at all on social media, or even if you aren't, that uh, phrase has probably come across your plate someplace uh, because it has grown in popularity, especially as it relates to black women. Maybe of a certain age, I feel like 25 plus, uh, it is all these kind of glitzy images of black women at cafes or on exotic vacations, maybe at home with a face mask. But it is this idea, and it was uh, coined by a Nigerian influencer, that you live a life of comfort and low stress. That is what the soft life is. And actually, uh, I was interviewed by uh, Andscape, so there's an article Myself and a very popular content creator, Tanika B, were both uh, quoted. So we'll link that in the show notes. And uh, we want to first explore not only what it is, but why it has taken hold. For you, though, Margo, as someone who maybe has been on the outside looking in, what has your interpretation been of this idea of the soft life? Well, at first, I interpreted it as upholding rest. Okay. Which I was so into. <laughs> Right, because we all Marco know. Marco loves a nap. We all know how much I love a good nap. Yeah. And how much I love, you know, nice sheets. Yeah. And, and being in comfort. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was revolutionary in the sense that it was focused particularly on black women because we don't have images. Um, and that of black women resting in comfort in that way it, because the struggle of the black experience and the black female experience has been so real and so visual. Absolutely. Um, so at first, and it's not that this has gone away. I was, I was really into it. Um, and then I started like, I, I mean, I think our listeners probably at this point understand this about me and I've definitely gotten feedback about my own social media. Like Margo, why do you only repost stuff that just us post? <laughs> It's like, oh, right, that's all I know how to do. <laughs> and um, I have a very fraught relationship, like a lot of people with social media. I, I think that it is incredible and gives us all access to a lot of things that we might not have access to in other ways. There's a certain level of meritocracy that's not in other environments. I also think it can be deeply painful and is not realistic. Mm -hmm. And that image, those images perpetuate a lot of the pain go back to our young girls a lot of the pain people feel about their own self-worth and their own value so I have conflicted feelings about it but yeah. um, I started to think that oh wow there might be a kind of fucked up underbelly of this that is not li lifting up rest and comfort but making people feel like they have to show themselves luxuriating in a certain way to be part of this life. So, so this is the complicated thing about it that I, I think we really wanted to dive into today because I love this idea of what you talked about, uh, rest. And rest, unfortunately, oftentimes being a privilege for certain communities and not for others. And that's why platforms like the NAP Ministry mm. that I think will soon also be a book if it hasn't it already been released. It is a book. 
and a journal and there's a space. Oh, this is fantastic. Why that was so revolutionary, because Audre Lorde said it best when she said, caring for myself is not an act of self-indulgence. It's a revolutionary act for a black woman. And so I'm paraphrasing the quote, but the idea is that just caring for who we are in a society that has told us we are not worthy of it is really, really important. And, and I think that's a message that will always be vital and always reign true as long as these systems of oppression exist. But when social media gets into the conversation, it is difficult to take all of the ideas that we've just talked about and truncate them into a post. Because mm-hmm. I could have that perspective as a content creator, but when you see me at the Ritz-Carlton with a bottle of Moet, you're not going to think that those those perspectives are what brought me to that moment. You're going to take from it, well, if this is the soft life, then let me get over to the Ritz-Carlton with a bottle of Moet. And I think that's that part of social media that you're saying can actually be really dangerous because it becomes much more performative than it does about the real root of the resistance. Right. It becomes performative and potentially inaccessible. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So if people think the soft life is going to a spa and having a $250 bottle of champagne with girlfriends, but they don't have access to a spa or the money to pay for that or, or any of it, then they're not welcome into this life. And let me give you all a real example about this because I like went on a rant about this to you and also on social media. It was in my story. So if you didn't catch it, it went away in 24 hours. But there, back to social media, a, there was a, 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 uh, a spa in Northern Virginia that went viral on TikTok. And I'm going to say their name because don't go there. It's called Ballion Springs, okay? When it goes viral on TikTok. And there are are black people who make this space go viral because um, I don't think we've had as much experience with these traditional Asian or Korean spas. And so we find this spa, it's huge, it's brand new, it's well-maintained, aesthetically, it's gorgeous, it makes great social media content. And when it first opens the entrance is $50. Then it goes up to 75 during the week and 90 on the weekends. I get my roommate a gift card in December for her birthday around the 19th, I think or so. When I decided to go in January to treat myself for a self-care day during the, during the 21 day happiness project, just to get in was $175 Marco. That includes no facial, no body scrub. No body work. It's just to get into the spa. Not even a bottle of water, my G. Just to walk across the threshold was $175. And then as I did some digging, I realized that they had been trying to keep out a certain demographic that people were coming in. They weren't, um, you know, behaving in a way that the spa felt was appropriate. And so they admittedly raised the price to put it out of reach for certain people, black people. So the problem here is twofold for me. Number one, $75 was actually too much fucking money because I go to a great smaller boutique Korean spa and it costs $30 to get in, right? It is a great time. The food is delicious. You don't have to really spend a thing to live the soft life, but especially not that type of money. Number two, what started to really frustrate me is I felt that people who don't have the privilege of knowing just life's everyday comforts and how we can be comfortable. This is my issue. Are so easily manipulated in this way of thinking that I have to spend $200 to go take a picture and post it on social media. And that all of a sudden means the soft life. And it doesn't. Right. And I think that, that, that therein lies my issue with it. I think there's also an obvious and less spoken about reality that white people have more access to soft life luxuries potentially than our marginalized or black brothers and sisters, right? And so if you have a car, if you can get to the country, if you feel comfortable going to the country, if you can go on a hike, if you can go to the ocean, if you know how to swim, right? All of these things that are free um, might not feel as or be actually as accessible to everyone in the same way. Can I tell the story about going to your Vermont house? Yeah. So this was a a really special moment because I was going through the breakup and just needed to get away. And Marco said, 
go to our house in Vermont. Stopped in Boston, saw her, she loved on me, and then I drove to Vermont, which I don't do a lot of road trips, but I needed to drive. That, that was a great road trip for me. When I got there, it was beautiful. Dog, it was like Narnia. I said, how is it the height of summer, the weather is immaculate. There's not an ounce of community. I slept in the master bedroom. I woke up and all I saw was green behind me everywhere. And then you and Mari came. Mari has a playhouse out in the back from the previous owners. And there were like wild flowers everywhere. What the fuck? Yeah. Right. Privilege. Money. It is so that, that, mind blowing. Right. And I can access that when I want. And let me just say also that Vermont is like that in many places and it has a population of zero black people. You, you know? And so there are all these ways that privilege buys you entrance. Right. In into spaces that can comfort your soul. Ooh. Right. And so when I say that I think it, it's predatory, I also say this with the utmost understanding of the privilege that I hold, that I don't need, one, I don't need to spend the money to go to a spa, right? Because I have access. Your life has certain comforts. Right, my life that I've created has certain comforts that give me access to the soft life. And I also know that that's predatory. And I wouldn't spend $175 because I could go to another spa and spend less, but that's also access and privilege. That's right? also privilege. Right, because I've had the exposure and the access, even when I didn't have my place in Vermont, right? Yeah, a a absolutely. Um, you know, and I also see, so I, I, I wanna break something down here that also I learned from my relationship with you, which is so important, Margo, is that you treat yourself to things that I don't think about. I think, because I come from an environment that is lacking in material things, and so many black people are, and I'm speaking about black women specifically intentionally here, when we get to that middle class income, we are post-college, post-grad school, we getting the Lexus, we're getting the Louis Vuitton handbag, right? We want all of the material things to adorn ourselves because we have spent our entire lives not having it and wanting it. Being around you has taught me those things are fine, but what also is and incredibly I actually I mean I also don't have many of those things, um, and I only have a few of them because of Tashira. <laughs> no, not because of Tashira, because Tashira has also taught me about the luxury of treating myself it in, goes a both ways, in a certain right? way that I would never have done before. And I'm not trying to privilege one no. over the other because I think that no, can but be anti-black, right? And I also think. It also, it could be anti-black, but it also could be the idea that white, li white people are like needy in a certain way. Mm. Well, so let me. So, so are you talking about acupuncture? Well, I was about to say that. So being around you has taught me that there are all of these services and things that I can take part in in a wellness space that make me feel fucking amazing. Right. Margo. And so I think what. Well, one of the memories that I have, so one of the first things I did for myself when I got a full-time job was start going to acupuncture because I have historically had, I, I think I've talked about this on the podcast, um, really bad anxiety, but it manifested for many, many years and still does at certain points, although it's much more controlled in just terrible insomnia and acupuncture helped mm. and it's expensive. And when I started in 2000. Eight, it was not covered by insurance. And I was making like $40,000 a year. Um, but I did it and it helped. And I remember getting you a session during chemo because I had read that it really helps with nausea. Now, I don't know if it did. It helped with nausea and it also helped with, I had really bad back pain, I think just from the moments of immobility. And I just remember going in one day and outside of the actual acupuncture needles, he pulled out some tool and it was like hot and there was steam coming from it. And he waved that thing across my back. And I just thought to myself, is this Narnia? Like, what have I walked into? So it's that. It's the retreats that you go on. It's the, you know, way that you poured into yourself post-surgery. All of these things are just as important. 
important. And unfortunately, those are the messages that if we are only looking to social media to provide a narrative for our lives, that we are going to miss. And it's so interesting, right? Because I think it's also what you see on social media. Mm. Because I see a lot of wellness content where I'm like falling short. <laughs> right. And so I think that's another thing just to be aware of that it's an exercise in separating yourself from groupthink in all of the ways and what brings you comfort. Right. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can be a couch potato and watch a movie and eat a bunch of junk food. And that could be your soft life. Mm -hmm. Or you could buy a bag or you could go to the spa, I, right? I, I think that's kind of where I feel like the message becomes too singular. It's myopic. Um, and to the degree that people who are, I mean, this term came from an influencer, right? The people who are in my profession have been the gatekeepers of this. I think we also have a bit of accountability around it as well, which is why when I had that experience at Ballion Springs, and I just walked out of there, I was like, it's no way. I, I looked around, there's this uh, gif of uh, Viola Davis on how to get away with murder, and she looks around, she picks up her purse, rolls her eyes, and walked out. That is how quickly I dipped out of that place. Um, we have a responsibility of also being transparent when things are not lining up and when they are manipulative and they are used to exploit people who are attempting to just rest, like you said, to just simply rest. And we have not been given enough avenues in order to be able to do because so. Because most people can't rest in their home. There's not enough space. There's too many people. There's too much responsibility. This is across, you know, groups, right? Yeah. And so leaving your home and going somewhere is what many of us have to do. But let's do it with care and thought about about how we we provide that those spaces for yeah. people. And also, obviously, not patronize institutions that don't want us there. I, well, mean, that, I mean, that's a whole other conversation writ large. What advice would you have for someone, Margot, who is saying, like, I feel overwhelmed, I feel like I'm sinking, I'm inspired by this soft life movement, but I don't know where to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I think it's, it's, it's multifold, and you have helped me with a lot, and I've done a lot of self-inquiry, too. I think it's really kind of digging into what makes you feel good, right? So let me use some examples. Cost is always going to be an impediment that can be used as an excuse, mm -hmm. right? And, and many times it is, it is an impediment, but many times it's not. So for example, if moving your body is something that makes you feel good or doing group fitness is something that makes you feel good, but you don't have the cash to do it because it's expensive, most small group fitness studios, including yoga studios and Pilates studios have some form of work study where like at my yoga studio, it's called the karma team where they do clean up and get free classes. Um, I'm volunteering at the front desk. I get free classes. Um, most studios have that option. So if moving your body and, and doing yoga or Pilates or group fitness is something that makes you feel good and you don't have the cash to do it, figure out a way to do it. That would be one. If being in community is something that that gives you a lot of comfort, um, but you don't have a lot of means. There are lots of public spaces in cities, in towns, in different communities where you can sit in public and share food. And so I think about picnics. You can be in community without feeling like you have to access or pay to cross the threshold, mm -hmm. as you said. Um, I think, and you can speak more to this than I can, but let's not forget that people have very, very vibrant spiritual lives. And a lot of those soft life principles can be born in religious communities as well, right? That there can be peace and solace in prayer, in prayer and community. Um, I, I also think that one of the things that brings me a lot of joy is, is eating with friends and loved ones. And um, while I love going out, I also love entertaining. And there are lots of different ways to do that at low cost, right? P a potluck or everyone bringing a plate is something that we I often do with my friends just because of our lives right yeah. now. And so I, journaling, reading, taking a walk, um, being apart from your family, being with your family, I think it's really individualized. And I really encourage 
people to start thinking about what gives them peace. Even if there are things swirling around you that are, are, are being thrown at you as the, as the answer. I, I think that's it. Because in every example that you gave, I kept thinking to myself, but people have to know that's actually what they need and what they enjoy. And that's the first exercise. Right. So one of the things for me over the last couple of years, I, I am kind of this weird, well, I don't even know if it's weird, but I consider myself social, but needing a lot of time alone. Mm-hmm. And I never really let myself own that because I was an only child for so long that I always felt so lonely as a child that in my adult life, I've spent a lot of time being social and every moment, every free time was filled with social engagements because that's what I believed made me happy. And at the time it really did. And as I've, as I've gotten older, I've really shied away, particularly big group events. I really don't like anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've just stopped going. Good for you. Just check out. I just say, no, thank you. Like I love to see people one-on-one or with their families, but I don't want to go to big parties really that much. Or, I mean, it also could just be a phase, but I'm just letting myself Trust myself here. Just be. And that's part of being a big age. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, you? I have uh, spent some time acquiring the things, right? Getting the handbags, getting the this, getting the that, getting the sunglasses, um, driving the car. And I looked up one day and I was like, fuck this shit. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't still love fashion and that there will not always be a part of consumption that goes along with me as an individual and my brand. I'm true to this shit. I'm not new to it. Like, I've, I've had my favorite outfit since I was five years old. Like, I've always been very particular about the way that I present. But the older I get, the more I do not care about the things. And the more I realize that owning that is really where my power resides. Mm. That's probably what I hope is the most inspiring thing to people. My corner of the internet, particularly around YouTube, is about um, capsule wardrobes and conscious consumption and shopping with intention. It has become almost a means of ministry in order for me to say, hey, I I know in this... um, you know, era of social media domination that I'm probably part of the problem in some ways in this era of fast fashion and mass consumption and post-industrial capitalism that we're being told to buy, 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 like in sync, buy, 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 right? Constantly. However, there is an alternative to this that can make us just as happy. And I I'm looking forward to exploring that more because for me, that's that nexus where the soft life truly Mm. resides. Yeah, I also think there's something about simplicity that we've lost in overconsumption. I mean, I feel this too, that it's hard to find peace in in actual physical spaces when you're overrun with stuff. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, very first world, Mm -hmm. (laughs) very first world, Uh, because for sure we are yeah holding on to any number of things that are crowding our physical space, our mental space, our emotional space, etc. And there's an energy there that I think you have to have a liberation almost to truly uh, live these principles of comfort and low stress that were indicated by the soft life mantra. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's possible in all the ways that, that you just mentioned. I've realized that I love walking every day. I could walk every day and see something new about my neighborhood and my environment every day. It's almost like there's a yearning I have to just get outside every day. Uh, you know I love journaling. Like a Sunday when I have my time where I'm just planning and looking forward to my week, it's almost like my God time. I love it as much as anything else that I that I do. It is a spiritual practice because it's just me thinking about how I want to be intentional about the week. Now, do I go shopping? Do I enjoy material things? Do I get excited about a new dress? Sure, but that's not my priority any longer. And I think because it's not, it makes those moments even more sweet. Yeah. The other thing that I was thinking as you were talking is, you know, what would we say or what would you say in moments where you're struggling? Like, how do you incorporate the soft life um, or soft life principles when you're in struggle? And um, I, I, I thought of this kind of various times over the last couple of years, particularly when I am in some low points and I'm not doing what, I'm, what I know will make me feel better. 
right? Like getting out for a walk or calling a friend or I don't know, moving my body, Mm -hmm. which are things that are my ministry, but I stop doing those when I don't feel good. And I think part of the, the soft light principle is having those accessible to you to at least have that conversation with yourself. Like, okay, you can sit on the couch or you could do these things that are going to make you feel better. Mm-hmm. And doing those things that do make you feel better, I always say is like depositing into a savings account. Because mm-hmm. when you need it, you want to be able to draw from it to help you to stay motivated to keep doing them when you need it the most. Exactly. I think there's also this element that the deposit can be big and small. Mm. And that taking care of yourself yourself consistently in whatever ways that is important to you will pay off for for those moments where things are harder to access. It doesn't have to be this big grandiose thing. It doesn't have to be the big trip with 15 friends. Right. It doesn't have to be a big trip to the spa. It doesn't have to be the fanciest restaurant with the fanciest bottle of wine. And I hope people who are listening to this, especially our younger listeners, really take hold of that principle that you just mentioned. I mean, going back to the study that you mentioned earlier, right, this trauma and this stress and these feelings of low mood that, you know, girls are are facing every single day that girls are facing every single day, these acts of self-care and learning to explore their joy earlier oh. is, is quite possibly one of the antidotes to what they're experiencing. Yeah, and I talked a lot about that that in the interview, that if, if I had had the skills that I know now help me when I was younger, how much pain could I have avoided? Mm. And don't we want that for the younger generation? A hundred percent we do. So you all let us know, especially if you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a comment. What does a soft life mean to you? Do you think it's complicated? Do you think it's straightforward? What are examples of the soft life for you? We'd love to know. And please do the same thing wherever you're listening to us. Absolutely. And do you have other terms that you think are more appropriate for what we we've interpreted the soft life to mean? We would love to know. In the meantime, friend, what is one thing you're going to do for yourself today? Well, we're going out to dinner. Very excited about that. We're having Greek food, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited about that. I want like something um, full of like tomatoes and herbs and cucumbers. Oh, I was thinking you were going to say flaming cheese. Well, that could be delicious as well. <laughs> I'm just craving like, maybe I'm just thirsty. I don't, I don't know. I want, well, like, I'm sure we can find something. Things, can we find water? Like, we- <laughs> <laughs> and a cucumber salad. <laughs> What's one thing you're going to do for yourself? Uh, I'm going to sleep. I, I, I am looking forward to going to bed probably by 8 p.m. I'm, I'm going to pull one of your moves tonight. I got to take, take that thing to the house. By the way, guys, um, I was at the basketball game last night to like 11. So I just want to put it out there. Yeah, Margo. So let me just say, we went to a basketball game. Margo's a true fan, guys. I, I wanted to report that. Margo's actually a true fan. She was focused the entire game. And my, my favorite players were out before injury, but go Celts, you really pulled it in. And I mean, when the dancers came out, she was teaching herself the choreography in real time. <laughs> I was fucking impressed. So go Celtics. Go Celtics. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. <laughs>